Hi, students. This is Professor Laney here. I am doing a lecture, a separate lecture for the first part of module one, and then I'm going to do a separate lecture for the second part of module one. I think it would be easier to separate and watch and, and break it up into little pieces like that. And then, um, yeah, I think that would be helpful because I know it's 100% online class and some people can come to the meetings when I have them on Thursdays, but some people can't. And I want to make sure that I'm being equitable and um, giving everybody options on how to get to the material, how to learn it, maybe have a backup way to learn it. And so I'm here for it. I'm going to share the screen and um, we're going to get to it. Again, I want to start off by saying um, Professor Valdez, she put together this, this format. It's fantastic. She's got a lot of um, experience in our field. She's been a leader in our field for about 20 years. And so I'm just very, very blessed that I'm able to, you know, have the benefit of a colleague's. She put in a lot of work over the last year for this class, and I'm just new to it. Not the content, but just the format. And so i um, really excited to show you this really cool content with the tabs and things like that. So let's get to it. So again, this is module one. Uh, and this section is the identify the agents and methods of socialization. Now, in the intro, we talked a little bit about um, what socialization is. Again, it's a process. It's a lifelong process to take new members of society and teach them the rules of society. Now, again, there's a lot of different ways that happens, and there's a lot of different types of influences that happen. So we're going to get into that a little bit more here. So again, um, when we say here, socialization is the manner, it's a process used to internalize, like adopt in internally, the norms, like the normative, we don't mean normals, we mean the normative rules and ideas of society and helps maintain social and cultural continuity. Let's start with something like, um, you know, again, kids, they are new to the planet and we are telling them we don't, you know, our hands are for nice touches and we share with our friends and we clean up after ourselves and things like that. So there's ways that we teach them to be, you know, functioning members, functioning adults, right? Childhood is practice for adulthood, right? And so what that does is that um, the norms and ideas of society are passed down through the agents of socialization and it helps maintain social and cultural continuity. So for example, if you never taught your child or you were never taught as a child um, manners, how would one go through life not saying please or thank you? Now you can, but it's not exactly creating uh, social and cultural continuity, right? In certain cultures, it's very, very important to be polite. In certain cultures, it's not. And certain cultures may be misinterpreted as being very, very direct and brusque, but that's just how their culture is. And so again, we focus a lot in this class about how socialization occurs for you, because once we learn it about ourselves, then we can learn it about how it's happening in other people, most likely different than yours. So right here, identifying the agents and methods of socialization. Think of it in two ways. There's an agent, a person or an organization or a body or a group of people that would be like an agent. Think of it as like a secret agent or an, uh, an agent of change, a catalyst. Um, think of it as a mentor, an influencer, anything like that, that can be an agent of socialization. They can do it straight out and say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to do this. Or they can just act a certain way and then you copy them. So we'll talk a little bit more about intentional and unintentional socialization. But it's based on an agent, a person, a, an entity, a group, a, even like, um, like a large corporation like Disneyland or uh, Amazon or things like that can influence a person, right? Those are agents of socialization. Uh, the method of socialization and how that agent uses that. Again, that would be like something like you're, you're, um, you're playing soccer and you, did you do uh, uh, kicked it with your foot or hit it with your head? You still got the ball into the goal, right? So it's these different methods on how socialization occurs. And some people have a particular way of doing it. Some people use a different, a lot of different ways and certain entities do it a little bit more stealthy and some ways do it very outwardly and things like that. So it, it's happening constantly to all of us all the time. So don't forget to go through these tabs because the tabs are put into place so you don't have to keep looking at this long, 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 long document. Tabs are pretty cool, yeah? So again, I'm not gonna read everything to you, but this is a exact replication of our book. Some of you like to have that book in your hand. Some of you like to have it side by side, whatever. But everything from the book is put into here. 
And so it begins with a story and there's this little girl who was abandoned. And so how do we know how she was socialized if she was maybe alone? And again, socialization happens in the context with other people. So again, let's say there's those stories of like raised by wolves or think of like Tarzan and things like that. How did they learn how to be human? Well, Tarzan learned how to be an ape because that was his socialization group. Those were the agents of socialization. He clearly copied what he was seeing. Same thing. If this girl had nothing to copy, how did she learn? So every once in a while we hear of, uh, you know, kids who are being neglected or left alone. How do they become socialized? It's really kind of thought provoking if you really think about it. What are the goals, goals for socialization? Socialization wouldn't occur if it wasn't needed, right? So the goals for socialization are pretty similar across all peoples, all cultures, all countries. We most specifically focus here on the United States because that's our context. I can't speak about every culture, but a lot of cultures still follow the same basic pr principles of humanity, of learning how to be a grown or mature adult version of our baby version of humans so again socialization is the process which people are taught to be proficient members of society notice that we've talked about this this definition in different ways multiple times already we talked about it applies to infants but we also talk it, that it applies to new members of our society and so when we say people we could say new members like brand new babies or we could say people who are new to our culture if you even if you are new to this college or new to canvas or new to a new computer, cell phone, or job, you had to be taught how to be proficient in that society. Think of it like if you work at Chipotle, you are a part of Chipotle society and you have to be a proficient member or guess what? You're fired. And that's okay. You move on to the next place. But in our society, if you don't become a proficient member, you run into a lot of problems. I mean, it could even end up being incarcerated or worse. So again, socialization is a lifelong process. And as a hundred percent reminder, socialization is not the same as socializing. I get that from students every once in a while, even at the end of the semester. I'm super socialized because I like to have a lot of friends. I'm like, oh no. If you can tell me those friends taught you how to transfer to a four-year college because they went the year before you, that's socialization. That's teaching you something. So uh, make sure that you know the difference. And again, oof, that's like super cringe at the end of the semester when somebody gets it that wrong. Yeah. Um, so again, there's these points that are pulled out of the broad and narrow socialization from um, sociology, Jeffrey Arnett. He says, socialization teaches impulse control and helps individuals develop a conscience. Well, we've also seen times when that doesn't occur, where people aren't taught a conscience, where people aren't taught impulse control. And the funny thing is, is our society really looks for that, some sort of like getting along with people and not causing a riot and not screaming fire in a crowd and not you know, hurting people and things like that. But some people haven't learned that or some people have learned it and then go against it, right? But think about it for a second. And um, I always have like a lens of, of neurodiversity here that a lot of times, even if you see a young child who's having like stimulation overload or sensory processing overload or a poor impulse control, you, you get stares. People are like, oh, what's wrong with that kid? You know, um, it's because we want, we have an expectation in this culture to keep, kids, you know, within reason, not, you know, climbing over furniture or having a big meltdown and things like that, but it happens. Even adults have them. So again, we teach these things and hope that they come together. But some people, number one, weren't taught these things and number two, go against them. So socialization is an important process to make sure that our society moves forward S sort of smoothly. There's going to always be bumps, but again, it's all about really conformity and safety. And we'll talk more about that too. Socialization teaches individuals how to prepare for and perform certain social roles. Like, again, if you don't want to be a parent, it could mean a worker. It could be somebody who pays taxes. It could be somebody who drives on the right side of the road. That's a safety issue. But even we, we trust everybody to follow that role. It's fantastic. Right? So there's, again, there's a lot of um, social roles that we do expect of people. And sometimes people just don't want to do that. They want to do something different. But for the most part, our society teaches a pretty decent set of social roles and expectations. Again, it's up to you whether you follow those or not. Socialization cultivates a shared source of meaning and value. A shared source of meaning in our culture is a language. It's language. We share the ABCs and one, two, threes. Every culture has a shared source of meaning and value. Um, we also have 
things that are like our some of our language is like social media based or computer based or technology based you know um uh, like sometimes language is is money right so again we in our society we we have the same set of language money things like that that we share i can't go to down the street to walgreens and and bring like chinese yen right or such japanese yen and pay there can't do that we have a shared set of tools in our society that we all conform to or use utilization and again socialization is a general process but it takes place in specific contexts we'll talk about that the specific contexts are like those agents i talk about like could be a, a company uh it could be a person it could be a group of people think of like boy scouts or church or family or cousins or um, even extended family or even something like um sports technologies things they socialize you how to do certain things and uh, expect you to be able to um, follow along talks a little bit more about how COVID-19 changed some of these socialization process we all had to be socialized immediately to not being social socialization still occurred it's kind of interesting to think about it that we are still being socialized while we were all apart from everybody we learned how to reconnect with people even if it was electronic and some people at the end of COVID have not snapped back some people just don't want to leave the house like ever again so COVID really did put a nice big monkey wrench in some of our socialization processes but in changing those processes we have other ways to socialize too so it's really kind of interesting how we keep moving forward to society even though things change Next tab is nature versus nurture. I love this one. I've shared with you guys that I have an adopted son, mixed race, and uh, he has autism and ADHD. He's not of my biology, but you know what? The funny thing is, is that's his nature, right? He has, you know, olive skin and brown eyes and like an Afro hair and he's 15 and he's like wearing like a men's size large. So he's a big boy. Um, we do not, again, we do not share genetics, but spend five minutes with him and he sounds like me talking because that's his environment that's his nurture so when i was arguing we were arguing the other day and uh well he says no i'm I'm not arguing mom i am passionately speaking to the contrary i was like i could say nothing because that sounds like something i'd said at some point and so he picked it up from his environment. I was like, all right, I hear you passionately advocating to the contrary. However, not doing said responsibility in the house loses your technology kind of situation. So we'll talk more about behaviors in a minute, in a minute and natural logical consequences. Um, but again, our genes are the nature and the environment's nurture. And so the um, one of the discussion boards of the round table has to do with this nature versus nurture. And if you've ever grown up in a house where like your parents are still married and there's a, you know, you and your siblings, but you guys all turned out differently, that's the nurture. There's out, external forces outside the family that help develop each one of your siblings differently. And that's exactly how it happened in my family too. Four siblings, I'm the third of four, and we are all very, very different. And it's really interesting because you were born in the 60s, one in the 70s, and one in the 80s. So that right there, generationally, or um, just for like pop culture, that changed a lot of different things there too uh questions to ponder right so again if we have our genetics nobody can really see your genetics from the outside and that's what we call the genotype our our genetic constitution our blueprint but the phenotype is how those genetics come together and and show you forward so my genetics include um people like my heritage is from like eastern europe so like from like the hungary region all the way behind the Swiss Alps, maybe a little bit, of, there's some German in there. Um, and then there's a little bit of like Irish and, and like, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's where my people are from. So my genetics share um, similar traits to those people. So you'll see blonde hair, lighter skin, I have green eyes. Um, that's my phenotype. Think of it as like a photograph. A photograph is your phenotype, what people can see, but your genotype is what it's on the inside. Now, the funny thing is, is that my my siblings, even though we share genetics 100% and my parents are still married, my two older siblings, um, people say sometimes they look Mexican because they have olive skin, brown hair, brown eyes. And it's because that's the, they're the more Hungarian side of the family. And me and my little sister are a little bit more blonde. So we look a little bit more like the German side of the family. 
I've had people literally who we went to high school together and said, how are you guys, how do you guys know each other? I'm like, we're related. We're sisters. Really it made us pull out our driver's licenses. That's how different we look. We have some similarities, but for the most part, and very different personalities, very different temperaments, very different ways of looking at the world. So it's really kind of cool that one like family, one set of genetics can turn out so very, very different. So that's why I love sociology because I was like, well, psychology is psychology. That's great. Our genes are there, but they don't determine how we express those things. Right. And so very super fascinating to me. And so again, make sure that you know anything that's bolded here, this passive genotype environment, it correlates when children passively inherit the genes that their family provides. Now, again, let's say I had a biological child and that kid was really good at singing and art and was great at school. And I would be like, okay, this it's correlated to who I am. I mean, you might see that in your family, like, or you might hear that, oh my, you're so much like your dad. You're so much like your mom. That's your passive genotype environment. It's inherited. It's a sort of correlation. Evocative means that means the social environment reacts to the individuals based on their characteristics. So for example, like I said, I'm, I love music. I play music every day. I sing, I play music pretty much my whole life. And I mean, I'm not like fantastic at it, but I just do it for fun. Um, but my son, again, not genetically mine. He's not biologically from me. I'm like, I wonder what he's going to be good at. Put a guitar in his hand and he's better at guitar than I will ever be. And so now he's guitar, bass, keyboards, drums, everything. He's like, but he doesn't have good tone, tempo, or rhythm, or a singing voice. But I have that. It's weird. It's kind of funny. So we both come to music, but think about it. If I, as an adoptive parent, never introduced it, right? This is the social environment. He wouldn't have had the experience of it. I would be like, oh, well, he has autism. He's not going to be good at school. Guess what? They have a rock band at his autism school. Don't ever underestimate the neurodivergent, <laughs> right? So again, same thing with, I was like, okay, well, um, you know, his dad was really good at soccer. We put him in soccer. <laughs> that did not work. You know, kind of said his dad's really good at riding a bike. You know, you rode a bike from Irvine to Georgia and yeah, put the kid on the bike and he's great, but he doesn't like long distances. He likes mountain biking. So it's interesting. You, if you introduce stuff, there's, it's, uh, it might land, it might not land, you know, or try to do different things with him and he doesn't like it, right? Um, an active genotype environment, cor its correlation occurs when individuals seek out environments to support the genetic tendencies. So for example, if my son was um, super tall, maybe he'd look for basketball kind of situation. And so he's not super tall, but you know, it's one of these things like sometimes people will say that, oh, well, you're long and lanky, you'd be a really great swimmer, or you're really strong. Have you considered gymnastics or things like that? So again, it's really interesting to kind of pick and choose what lands. And again, sometimes there's a genetic disposition, right? Sometimes there's no gene that marks music musicianship, but if your environment can afford it or can't afford it, it's interesting. Think about it this way. Um, also thinks about it when there's language. So if we talk about language, passive genotype means that correlation occurs when children passively inherit the gene. So there's no gene for language, but what you're exposed to is the, the language that your parents are going to speak. Here is how the social environment reacts to individuals based on their in inherited characteristics. So again, the social environment, uh, my son is, he's part Mexican. So I, I learned how to speak Spanish and he's sort of learning. So I'm kind of reacting first for me, because I want to be a teacher who speaks Spanish, but here is when he, they, we seek out environments that we suppose he's Spanish, he's Mexican, he needs to speak Spanish. He's not doing so great, but he's getting on board because I'm introducing it to him. So this means that it, this one means that it shows up. This means that it can show up. And this means that we actively seek it out. It's really kind of cool. So read more on that. And again, twins can be totally different or they can be totally same. I think we all know at least one pair of twins and they'll tell you, no, we're totally different. And maybe they are, maybe they're not. It's really kind of cool. So agents of socialization, my favorite part, this is like, like the agent, the stealthy little agent, <laughs> sometimes not so stealthy, but this is a combination of people in social groups, right? So you can have experiences through these social groups through, um, it, it can be a lot of so many different people. So look at here. We have family is usually the primary agent of socialization. When you get older, it's your peers. Sometimes religion also affects family, also affects you. Um, government. Yeah. If you're here and you're afraid of the government, that's a big deal. Yeah. 
how does media affect a person's social? Yes, media, absolutely. They're saying girls with social media are more depressed than girls without social media. So, buddy, how do you keep social media out of a kid's hands? It's hard. Work can socialize you as well. Absolutely. I work at a higher at an institution of higher education. This absolutely socializes me to be a certain, there's an expectation here of production and performance and output and things like that. Um, with this blue one, ethnic background. Absolutely. Um, like, again, I shared with you guys, I present as like a white Caucasian, maybe German person. Um, but my ethnic background is actually Eastern European as well. And so, and then I have a grandparent who's, um, who's Portuguese, Dutch Portuguese. So it's like, we're all a little bit mixed, right? <laughs> and so, um, again, our ethnic background has a lot to do with being socialized there. That is an agent of socialization. You could say, in, you know, in our culture, we celebrate this, this holiday or we don't, right? Uh, clubs and social groups. Absolutely. Let's say you belong to Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, uh, any, any sort of like club or even like a car club could help socialize. Yeah. And then school, school's a big agent of socialization. Absolutely. There's a lot of, a lot, look at this grammar rules, social setting values, how to get along with people, how to listen to adults, how to maybe advocate in, in your, um, into the contrary, positively and productively. Um, there's more videos here too. Make sure that you go through all these, all these options. They're here for you. Now, temperament is a little bit of, this is more of the biological, the genetic piece. And this is when we say um, innate, that's what that means. It kind of looks like the word inmate, but it's not. Innate means inside characteristics that determine an individual sensitivity to various experiences. Like, so for me, um, like, so we'll, we'll learn about, so it's like when you have a new baby in the family or you meet somebody's new child and that child can get passed around the room with dope cries. We call that child um, easy that's an easy baby. You know, they can they eat whenever, they sleep whenever, they don't really cry. They're fantastic. And then there's the other one <laughs> who cannot be pulled off of their mother ever. They they have to eat at a certain time. They have to sleep at a certain time. They have to eat certain foods. They're just a little bit more challenging. And we usually use the word difficult, but I don't like that. It's just a little uh, a child who's a little bit more specific in their needs. And then there's one in between. One that's a little bit standoffish, and then they turn into a little bit of an easy baby, but might have a little bit of some challenging tendencies. And we call that one slow to warm. So I was a slow to warm. I would hide behind my mom for a new babysitter and then like be like, I'm shy, which is like not what a sh shy kid would do, right? You don't announce that you're shy if you're shy because I wasn't. Um, so it's that piece where, and then my temperament, was I really shy or was I the th third child? And I had an old brother and sister who picked on me. So was I shy because I had to be because of my environment? Or was I shy because that's just how I came out? I wasn't shy. I mean, I just learned the shy was because of the environment. Now that I don't have that environment, kind of not that shy. I am introverted. And we'll talk about that later. But I am introverted, but I can do this small group or these lectures, no problem. Um, I can also speak in larger in front of a large crowd, but it's very draining for me. Um, so again, we learn about temperament is that's what you bring with you to any given situation. Um so I have friends who are like raring to go. Let's try something new. Let's do this. Let's do that. I have other friends who are like, nope. I'm like, how about, you know, happy hour on Thursday? And they're like, nope. <laughs> but wait a minute. We went to happy hour last week. And then they go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's fine. I'll come. You might have friends who are challenging, easygoing, or slow to warm. It's very simple to see. If you really start to think about it, you can overlay it on your adult friends or family. Now, family, 100%. The reason we put temperament first is that you bring this into your family. You're born with your temperament. That's it. I mean, and then we build a personality on top of that. And I already mentioned that you can go with the flow with certain environments, but family is the number one agent of socialization. Family is first, the first, the most important agent of socialization. I will ask you this a hundred times. Again, we can turn out like our parents. We can turn out opposite to our parents. But the bottom line is they're the people who bring us into the world and they're the people who teach us what they think is important for us to be successful. There's not a parent on the planet that says, I'm so excited to have like a baby and like be horrible. I just want to teach them like the worst and I want them to be the worst. And I want them to like suffer and have a hard life. Nobody, nobody. Everybody has this like very romantic, this big, 
imagination of like, oh, my child's going to be the president or be an astronaut or they're going to this, they're going to be millionaires or be influencers. Everybody has like, I want a baby so I can do a great job, right? Some people are prepared to do a great job. Some people are not. But again, we'll talk about here about race, class, social class, religion, and other societal factors, how it plays an important role. Because you may be, have two loving married parents that happen to be two dads or two moms. Or we're seeing multifamilies in one room. And I mean, trouble situations who are never married and they're raising kids great. I heard of another thing called mom units. So it's a bunch of moms that live together with, with the kids and they kind of rotate who takes care of the kids. I was like, oh, it's amazing. But our, as our society changes, our socialization changes, but family doesn't. They are the number one agent of socialization. And again, children also are socialized to abide by gender norms, perceptions, race, and class-related behaviors. My son told me the other day, he's like, well, you should buy this for me because you're rich. And I was like, oh, what's rich to you? And he's like, you make like $400,000 a year. And I was like, oh, not at all. <laughs> no. So his perceptions, he was getting from his classmates, right? And so it's this thing where, you know, and by the way, he goes to a school where people are super rich. And I was like, oh, bro, that's not us. <laughs> and so gender norms are, you know, when he came home from school and said, you know, in kindergarten, he said, well, girls can't do math because their brains are small. I was like, Oop, let's talk about that. <laughs> At school, they, you know, your friends who may have told you that they are probably getting socialized that way, but not, this doesn't happen in our house. And so we still have to talk about boundaries. Um, no means no. Yes means yes. You know, uh, my word, when I say I'm going to take out the trash means I'm going to take out the trash. So things like that, those are important to me. And so I change, I try to socialize him to that. It's a struggle because they're not important to a 15 year old. <laughs> Integrity is not really, you know, on the docket for a 15 year old. It's like, you know, technology and friends and whatnot. Um, but race and class related behaviors are really interesting too, because he's of mixed race. And so he does identify as mixed. Um, and then even um, when it's like Black History Month, it happens to be that right now. I, you know, teach him and share him things and introduce him to different things. And um, he's like, yeah, but I'm only part Black. So I'm wondering if they're going to see me as part Black. I'm like, I'm, I'm curious about that. And so getting him to understand his race in, in contrary to ours, I mean, he is partially white too. He's being raised culturally white. Um, although he's also being raised with TikTok food. So homie wants to eat noodles every day. And so, and then class related behaviors. I mean, we're middle class. So we do class related behaviors, like go on short trips. We don't own an airplane. We don't, you know, we don't go to Ibiza every year, you know? So it's this thing and it, um, that we teach and hopefully they understand their role within those class structure and those gender norms. Um, again, there's a, there's a, um, little story in here about Sweden and the examples there. Again, we do a little bit different here. So when, every time you see this check-in time, ask yourself this question. If we were doing this lecture live, I would ask you this question. What are your thoughts? Should parents get the credit when their children try to be good kids or go on to accomplish great things? Or should they get the blame of their children turn out to be bad? It's kind of interesting because that goes back to the nature versus nurture. Was this child born a certain way or did you teach that to them? You know, every time we hear about like active shooters, then they go back and, oh, that kid had like, you know, he played video games in his basement for like 20 hours a day and they had access to guns and this and that, whatever. So that can socialize a child to have ideas to do things like that. But if that child didn't have those things or wasn't exposed to those things, maybe they wouldn't have those ideas. And it's hard to go back because hindsight's 2020, but socialization never, never stops. So it's not a surprise. Okay. So racial socialization, this is something super, super important. I want you to make sure that you that you get this because in our time here, uh, in our society, race relations are still an issue. And what's happening is that people think that all certain race is the same. All white people are this way. All Asian people are this way. All black people are this way. It's, no, not at all. So again, I really like the conclusion here that African-Americans are not a culturally monolithic group. That means they are not one culture. They They happen to have, some shared underpinnings, but they are not the same. They're not a culturally monolithic group. They're not just one group of people that act a certain way. There's different people who do different things and value different things in that socialization process. So make sure that you know, oh, that makes a huge difference. Then again, our parents will socialize us. You might hear um, some parents say, well, girls don't, girls don't get angry and boys don't cry. 
right? And sometimes parents are different like that. Um, in my house, we let my son play dress up. We let him put on nail polish. We let him do whatever he feels is okay. You know, it, it's, it's not easy sometimes. Um, but at the same time, it's natural for people just to explore their universe and say, I like that. I don't like that. I like this. I don't like this. Right. So, and then sometimes he wants to wear it out. Sometimes he doesn't. And so it's like, Hey, that's, that's okay. Um, instead of chores, I say home responsibilities because chores usually end up to be the woman's job. And that's not, that doesn't, that doesn't fly anymore. Everybody should have a, a piece of the responsibilities of the house. And again, social class too has a thing here too. If we're, if we want to make our children be more successful than us in the prior generation, we want them to raise their social class. And so going to college and getting a job, but also parents, gender, parents, sex, it kind of outlines how they treat different, how they treat their own children differently. It's interesting because women try to are a little bit more open with gender roles and men will like treat their daughters a little bit softer and their men, their boys a little bit more rough and tumble. So it's really kind of interesting if that's the case. I mean, I was a pretty rough and tumble girl. So it's one of those, like, are things changing or are people still trying to hold on to what they were taught as a child, right? I've been literally told in my house by my son, um, outdoor work is men's work and indoor work is, is women's work. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting because I was out there planting and weeding and things like that. So who's going to do the inside then if I did the outside today? Like, oh, you? Oh, you're going to do it, <laughs> right? So I do challenge those things that he does pick up from other places too. Peers, another major agent of socialization. As you get older, whoo, those peers became even more important than your families, right? Oh man, I, I yeah, I'm telling you. How many times do you tell your family, I just want to hang out with my friends. What are you guys doing? Nothing. Probably right. Peers just want to spend time with each other. Look at this picture. I love this. They're all different, but they're like, they're playing a game, but there's also a puzzle. And then she's on her cell phone. Like, that's pretty normal. Just hanging out and doing nothing is better than being with your parents when you're a teenager. So the downside is peer pressure. So my son came to me this week and said that he was feeling peer pressure and um, in fact, it wasn't from, it wasn't from a peer. It was from a worker at his school who said you, hold on, let me move this, who said, um, because he likes boys and girls. And she goes, you know, it's probably just better if you like girls, like you're way more of a girl liking boy, like you should like girls. And he was like, my, I didn't know what to say. And I was like, well, you can tell her that her opinion doesn't have an effect on your life. I mean, like teachers and schools can have a, a, an, an effect, but no, it's, she happens to have a religious dogma that says it's okay. It's better to like a girl than a boy. And she even told him, she goes like, you, you could go to hell. And I was like, Ooh, making calls, making calls. <laughs> right. But here's the thing, same with peer pressure. You could um, have somebody say, well, you should date that person and you're not ready for it, but your friends are telling you, or how about uh, mean girls? We wear pink on Wednesdays. You know, it's like, oh, peer pressure, kind of crazy. So again, check in time, ask yourself this, this helps you with this class. How do peers play an important role in your life? Do you, did you follow with a group? Did you not have any group? Did you, you know, it kind of depends. You may have had a click that you've had it for a long time. You may not have the same friends carry through. You mean you might uh, go attract to new friends. You might new, meet new friends at college. How, but how did they play an important role in your life? Sometimes people say, well, I didn't have any friends in high school. That shaped you as well. That was a socialization process. You had to learn things on your own, but also you made that connection with, I'm just going to be me. And that's okay too. I think that's fantastic. I actually really, uh, uh, I really, um, what's the word? Admire that. Okay. I'm going to take keep trying to put my face somewhere. Okay. That's what's less, less problematic. Um, how did peer pressure impact decision that made you, that you made as a teenager? I remember being pressured by boys back in the day, you know, just a little bit of this and just a little bit of that. And it was like, mm, no, I'm good. Now neighborhoods, these are absolutely uh, a way to socialize, uh, new people or young people. Um, where you live has a lot to do with who you've turned out to be. And think about it. Let's say if you, let's say you live in Garden Grove versus Irvine, I'm not saying 
either one is great or bad, but those are two different places. How about let's do something. I'm going to stay in, I'm going to stay in Orange County and do it like this. How about Brea versus Costa Mesa? Different. How about um, Capistrano versus, um, let's see, what's it good? Placentia. Two different places. Same county. Two different places. Really kind of interesting. So neighborhoods have a lot to do with how people are socialized. In fact, if you live in Irvine, they name their streets after Ivy League schools. They name their high school university. Um, that's not a subtle socialization. That's a socialization over the head. You guys are going to live here. You guys are going to go to college. <laughs> it's clear as a bell. It's hilarious, right? And again, with a lot of people in the area or versus, let's say you live in a sub-rural or rural area, you have less people, that will have an effect on you as well. Now, child development centers, this is like saying going to school early. Zero to five is one of our biggest tenets here is like the most effect on a child is zero to five. And so getting a child into a child development center and yeah, I, when I went to Fullerton College preschool, it looked very much like that. They had the parents come in and, and do some work with the teachers too and things. It was really super fun. Um, again, child development centers have a guided curriculum or they have high levels of standards of care. And so we wanna make sure that even for infants, you can have childcare if apparently if a, even if a mother has to go to work. And so again, early childhood is defined as the age of normal schooling, five years in most nation, right? It's basically up to age five is ECE. That's what we call it, ECE. And then we have this National Association for the Education of Young Children. This is my professional association. When you become a child development major, this will be your professional association as well. We say zero to eight. And so that just means basically up to second grade. Right. Just when things are still fresh and new and you're still learning, the brain even grows and has this little resting spot between eight, seven and eight years old. And it's, it, that's a good time to then transition into the next level of life. School socializes. Yes. What do you do when a bell happens? What do you do when the teacher says this? Turn in the paper at this time. Do it like this. Color it like that. Right. 180 days a year. That's six months. Six months. Schools socialize. And I mean, the teachers, the classroom, the, the rules, the, the peers, everything. Schools socialize children the next best way that parents do. Now, some schools are better than other, right? And some schools have really high standards like um, uniforms. And uh, in Tustin here, not too far from our campus, there's a school of Tustin Memorial Academy where they expect the parents to volunteer a certain number of hours per school year and pay a certain number of like dollars to support the school for beautification and PTA. And I'm telling you, it's $365. They can either work the time off or just write a check. But at my son's school, they expect parents to volunteer a certain amount of time. And so, and that's another thing. And if, don't, if they don't, they send you a $500 bill. <laughs> you bet I'm volunteering. <laughs> Right. And so it there's a thing. So schools, they socialize kids, they socialize parents, they socialize the kids to be successful, to follow rules and things like that. Right. So we also talk about hidden curriculum, the things that's not in a book, but we teach kids and they learn it. So like if you're in trouble, you go to the principal's office. Doesn't that sound a little bit like if you're in trouble, you go to jail sometimes? There is a concept called a preschool to prison pipeline. We sometimes teach kids how to just end up being inmates. It's weird. Look it up. You can put that in your journal if you want to look more into that. When I, in the part two of the journal, when I ask what else is out there, that could that could count because it's talking about hidden curriculum. We learned that there was hidden curriculum here at our school too. When um, on our syllabus we put office hours. Now, some people know what office hours are, but if you've never been to college, you don't know what office hours are. And so taking a quick little poll, asking the class and saying, when you see the office hours, what do you what do you think of that? Now, I know what I mean by that, but what do you guys think I mean by that? Some of the students said, well, it's, you're in your office and you don't want to be bothered. So not to bother you. Like those hours don't bother you. Like what? Those are the hours that I'm here for you to bother me. Those are students. So I changed it to student support hours which is pretty much any time for me because that's how life works now. 
Um, but again, so students didn't want to come into office hours because they were like nervous and they thought they were bugging and they would thought they would get yelled at or whatever. That's part of the hidden curriculum. We, we as educators know what that term means, but students don't necessarily. So think about that too. Anything else that you learned that nobody really ever taught you? Sometimes it might be something like teachers are always right. Adults are always right. Mm, think about that. Talking about controversial textbooks. And my gosh, I know this isn't talking about China. It's pretty dire, but they're banning books in this country again. It's like 1930 all over. And so look through that as well. Community, true. The community also socializes children too. It could be like the actual community in which you reside or it could be a community that you belong to. So I belong to a drumming circle and like a, a few different communities. And uh, yeah, you bet I brought, I brought my kid. And so, yeah, again, different ways the community can support a child. There could be like, you know, free groceries. There could be free services. There could be concerts in the park. There's a lot of different things that can help socialize and support a child. Uh, religion, very, 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 very socialization <laughs> occurs very much in religion. Again, our society has rules, but inside of the society, there's a religion that have rules. And again, these are, um, these are members of the Jewish faith, and then they have rules that they learn and they follow, right? Or maybe your family doesn't practice your faith, or it's more of a cultural faith to you, or your family practices more than one in my house we do christmas hanukkah and kwanzaa and just november december based on the calendar and uh but we don't we're not like super devout anything so we just like to celebrate different cultures at different times and plus my kid thinks he gets more gifts so good to go but again I, many religious institutions uphold gender norms and contribute to their enforcement through socialization again there are certain religions that say when you're a woman and you're married you have to shave your hair off and wear a wig because hair is unclean on a woman you know but that's what people choose to follow and that's their thing some other religion in the united states you can create any religion you want you could create the church of elvis's peanut butter and bacon banana jelly sandwich you can do that here and so again the socialization process is not good or bad it's just part of their social their upbringing their influences and what's going on in their culture workplace you bet you bet your workplace think about it your parents have a workplace they're they are socialized at their workplace but then that their work doesn't really affect you but the type of work could think about it if your parents working in a factory versus a school or if they were working like a caltrans worker versus a clerk in a lawyer's office those those socialize you as well. And when you bring um, those standards back into your home, it makes a difference, right? Government socializes. <laughs> when you're 18, you can vote, you know, you can be drafted, you know, uh, you have to do this, this and that to get your driver's license. The government socializes. There's also a lot of news outlets out there. There's a lot of um, social media about government and news. And some of them are slanted this way and some of them are slanted this way, but both of those ways can um, clearly socialize somebody. Mass media, oh yeah. When I say mass media, I mean any sort of media here, internet, radio, magazines, newspapers, television, even billboards is mass media or a newsletter is mass media. Anything that goes out to more than one person is mass media. And so you could be driving home, listening to something very liberal and then see, something very conservative on a on a billboard and vice versa and so anything could be it could be a social a socialization agent in that respect okay so think about that what movies or tv shows impact as your child and how they influence your norms and values um so i watched happy days when i was a kid and then there was this like um kind of like a like a i don't want to say like tomboy girl in there i was all about it i was all about it she was name was pinky tescadero was in there and then her her sister she, her name was leather <laughs> that was the coolest thing because the rest of those guys i didn't like they were kind of nerdy <laughs> and so there might be things that you're like oh my gosh yeah i totally that's how i was you know when i was a kid growing up and that's what i really like and so this talks about a lot about the princess culture and it's true a lot of women think that they're just going to be rescued <laughs> and whatnot about princess culture so read that one Disney has a really baseline, like how to 
you know, a formulaic way. Only recently with like, um, with like Frozen, did it not have a love interest for the main character? Um, and it was a sisterly love. And then we had Onward that was a brotherly love. And so then we're seeing this kind of stuff too. And then even Willow just came out and it was like two female gay characters that were kind of in the leads and stuff, stuff like that. So we're changing, like the society changes and that's, I like, I like how that happens. So last tab here, and then I will stop and then I'll re-record the other one and do it separate because it can get a little long. Methods of socialization. So we talked about what is socialization? what how it occurs like kind of in the body like nature versus nurture it's kind of like this balance between the outside forces and the inside forces that who does the socialization the agents and the methods now th this is, can, can be kind of a lot and you know you guys are gonna have a lot for your notes but the methods of socialization are how these people get that socialization to occur a lot of times it just happens through talking modeling showing things like that but there's different little subtle ways of it so we call it here, these are kind of like, this is like the intro here. So affective methods of socializations. Again, we talk about affective has to do with emotions. So sometimes if there's any sort of emotional push-pull, that's, it's a, it's a way, it's a way. Uh, think about it. Like if you're, think about it like a, as a recipe, if you have chicken and you're going to make chicken, you can grill it, fry it, broil it, whatever, boil it. You could do all these different things with chicken. But these are the methods. Those are the methods. So affective, emotional, operant means following a pattern. It doesn't mean operating. It means first this, then that, then this. So following like a pattern, because that's how it kind of sinks in. Observational, clearly watching. Cognitive methods is thinking about it. And sociocultural methods are using the culture to determine the method. So sometimes you would say like, oh, we're going to go... Like I grew up Catholic and we went to um, catechism classes. So that was a sociocultural method of becoming a Catholic. And so things like that. So you'll see it in different cultures and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So affective means sometimes people use like love, anger, fear, or disgust to socialize a child. Like, so when, let's say a child comes home from kindergarten and they have like, they colored this you know, rainbow unicorn, peacock, and, you know, they show their parent and the parent goes, that's ugly. I hate it. You didn't, you didn't do a good job at all. So that would be disgust. That would be rejection. And sometimes that could make a child want to try harder or could make a child give up completely. But again, it doesn't have to be clearly like that, or it could be something even more like, oh, I really... I really appreciate it when you clean your room and it, you know, you contribute to the house and things like that. Right. Or don't talk to strangers because they could kill you fear. Yeah. So anytime there's an emotion involved, <laughs> yet that's an affective. So, but here's the deal. Sometimes those are really strong. They fear is a big teacher, a big motivator, right? Um, anger could be another thing too. And again, Based on temperament and environment, people react to these things differently. But again, an active affective method is using emotions, right? Hopefully it's a positive emotion and it can maintain um, attachments. Now, operant again, this is this is having a sequence that produces an effect. So one, two, three creates something, right? So let's say. And it usually includes reinforcement. So basically, if I said to my son, can you take out the trash, please? And he says, um, okay, and then takes it out. And then when he comes back, I go, um, you took it out all wrong. You did this wrong. You did that wrong. You did this wrong. And you, you know, you're a fit. Like I got on its case. The likelihood of him doing that again, taking out the trash goes down. But if I said, thank you, Miho, I appreciate that starting to smell and now the kitchen's a little bit cleaner i think you his likelihood of doing it again shows up so everybody everybody works on this and we'll talk more about that negative reinforcement is the termination of an unpleasant condition so people kind of kind of get this confused so if i said if i said um he's working on his homework and he's doing his math and he's like i hate math this is so dumb i'll say like hey do half let's 
pick, do the odd numbers and then go take a break. You can walk away. That's negative reinforcement. Taking something away when it's stinky, that's negative reinforcement. People think yelling and spanking is negative reinforcement. Nope. When you add something in, that's positive reinforcement. When you take something away, it's negative reinforcement. So like, for example, if I go get my taxes done, then I'll be done and I can go plan a vacation with my tax return. Right? Something unpleasant. I don't want to do it. Blah, 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 blah. Right? So again, people get that confused. It's a little confusing, but you don't have to have it memorized. But just remember that there's a difference between positive and negative reinforcement. Even if I spank a child, I'm giving them something. Spanking a child doesn't necessarily change their behavior. My son thrives on a, on an audience. When he's in trouble and I'm yelling at him, I literally asked him one time, you, you must love it when I yell at you. And he's like, I do. Because <laughs> there's no filter. It's beautiful. But when he's really in trouble, I say, look, you can't talk to me for an hour. I need space. You don't get the privilege of conversing with me. You were mean to me. You you did not. You stepped over my boundary that I set. You hurt me, blah, blah, blah. You don't get to talk to me for an hour. And man, does that torture him. I'm like, again, you don't get to play with people or be friends with people if you're not nice to them, especially your mom. So he, oh man, does he hate that? Mom, you're ignoring me. I said, I hate it when you're, you disrespect my boundaries. You hurt me. You did something. So I got something I didn't like. You need to understand what that's like. So natural and logical consequences, right? So I, the negative reinforcements is that I've removed myself, removed myself. We could be in the same house, but I'm just not talking to him. And that's hard, you know, but I don't let it go on for days and days and weeks. And then we unpack it and say, how did you like that? I didn't like that. Well, I didn't like it either when you X, Y, and Z, you know, like I'm going to do whatever and the like, mm, the money's missing out of my wallet. I was like, you know, natural logical consequences. So again, there's more than just positive and negative reinforcement. And we'll talk about, I'll talk about that as well. Observation and methods means like I saw somebody else do it. So I'm going to do it too. Doesn't mean it was always a good choice. But if you see somebody like first day at campus or walk into admissions or records, you might be like, oh, okay. I observe that person. That's probably where, you know, that situation is. Or where are those food trucks? You just start following the people that you can see. Right. Again, kids want to be like parents. Kids want to model. Kids want to do what whatever you're doing. So, again, they will learn consequences for behaviors of that modeling, too, because sometimes, you know, kids want to act all grown and we don't expect that either. You know, I, I love it when teenagers act all grown. It's like, well, OK, I see what you're, you're stretching there, but you're not ready for that. Cognitive methods of socialization. Use your brain. Use your thinking. Have you ever had somebody say to you, think about it? Think about what you're doing. <laughs> they are most likely a person who uses cognitive methods of socialization, right? Again, if you tell a two-year-old grab the shoe by their foot, by to their left foot by the right shoelace, they will not be able to follow that instruction. Sometimes you just you have to be um, developmentally appropriate here too. So again, sometimes um, parents a lot of times think that kids can have that conversation. Think about what you're doing, but they they're not there yet, right? Think about it. That wasn't a good choice. Don't run out in the street. Think about it. It's like, mm. or uh, Peyton, Peyton's dad will say like, go to your room and think about what you did. Uh, 15 year olds are not really there. Mm, right. So again, and that could affect a child's self-esteem. So um, if you're overshooting it, like when people get mad, when like a child's diaper training and or potty training, and then you're like, oh, you peed in your diaper again. Well, oh, they're still learning. And even after they even after they go no diaper, they could still have accidents. Well, if a parent really gets on their case, I could really lower their self-esteem. And it's it's disheartening. It's really sad. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Sociocultural. This again, this has to do more with our culture here. Our behavior, including our learned behavior, including knowledge, beliefs, art, morals, laws, customs, and tradition. So, like, for example, oh, we just Christmas was like a month and a half ago, there are so many expectations about what we do, when we do it, how we do it, how much money to spend, where we go, who makes the food, who has the tree, who has this, who, uh, blah, blah, blah. every family does that differently too. I mentioned that we, we do things a little bit different. We, we have the Kwanzaa Kanara, but that starts on the 26th. 
and sometimes the the Jewish calendar has um, their festival in November, and then in Christmas we didn't even have a tree. We just uh, we just kind of rolled it out, <laughs> did other stuff. So it just again, sociocultural methods can be the same every single year, or they can be a little bit different as as the years progress. But again, children can experience group pressure and find themselves trying to fit and conform. There's there's a point where sometimes kids are like, well, I don't want to do that because it doesn't feel good to me. And then you have adults say, no, you have to, because we've always done it this way. So again, we're teaching kids the norm, the norm expected behavior. But as you become adults, you can make your own choices there too. Um, again, traditions and symbols. Again, social cultural methods have to do with, let's say, having a quinceanera, having a bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, um, having a cotillion, have like uh, expected behaviors around 16. My my son turned 16 this month and he's like, I want a sweet 16. I was like, well, that's kind of for girls. You know, I mean, but that is gender stereotyping. Why can't boys have sweet 16? Right. So eh, well, we're going to kind of see how that rolls out. But again, traditions could be daily traditions. Oh, every morning we do this or every Thursday night we do this or every month we do this or every year we do this. Right. It could be visiting somebody's grave. It could be donating or volunteering. It could be things like that. So basically anything that is handed down from generation to generation. It's an also belongs to 100 black men in Orange County, and they do a lot of generational things. I mean, I'm clearly not black, but I have them in a community that teaches them sociocultural methods of socialization. They had they had um, soul food they had a soul food uh, celebration right before um, Kwanzaa, but we did the first day of Kwanzaa as well. Now, apprenticeship is almost like saying, here, come under my wing. I'm going to teach you how to do stuff. And you may have had an older sibling or an older friend teach you how to do things. It could be a, a coach, a peer, parent, teacher. And so apprenticeship is, is really like saying, let me teach you. I, I had my older sister who was learning algebra. Um, we're about five years apart. And she taught me algebra <laughs> five years early. And she was just, she was just interested in, in it at the time and then taught me algebra. And so yeah, I was doing algebra in the third grade. Yay. But that's not, you know, that wasn't a, quite a tradition, but an older sibling teaching and a younger sibling something. Yeah, it could be a tradition. All right. So that is our first M1 reading agents of and methods of socialization. Super rad. I love this stuff. This is so great. Again, I want to invite you to ask any questions at any time. But, you know, based on our meeting that we had this morning, it was amazing. You guys are on, on, on the ball. It's really cool to see. Uh, I like to be enthusiastic about this, but I also like to, you know, see you guys get all fired up about it too. So thank you for everything. Thank you for being flexible. And I love that we're already off to a great start for this semester and let's keep it up. All right, friends, let me know if I can help you in any way. We'll see you next time.